Welcome one and all to the Yankee Town Community Church. We hope you enjoy the praise and get praise from the service, from the pastor's message, and also from Richard Foster singing. <laughs> Anybody know what the temperature is in Hawaii? <laughs> Yeah, it might be warmer in Hawaii than it is here, but may, may our hearts be warmed with God's love today. For we have come to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let us prepare our hearts for worship while Diane plays the prelude for us. Psalms 99, 1 through 3. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Amen. Amen. his throne room with prayer. So shall we pray together. Father God, we draw into your presence as your children, taking the privilege of standing at your feet, looking forward to learn and to grow where we're planted. Allow us, Father, the, the discernment and the wisdom to be able to sift through all the things that we come to all week long to know the truths that you would have us live with, to push away the stuff that means nothing. We thank you, Father, that we have your love and your oneness in our hearts and lives. Help us, Lord, to listen for your call and to be ready, to be ready, to have our lamp trimmed and to be ready to go when we are called and to do what you would have us do. Lead us in your ways of love and everlasting. And may the remainder of this worship service be a testament to our love for you and to feel the love you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair the same earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. 
tears from your eyes. You're his child, and he cares for you. He'll come down from the sky, brush his tears from your eyes. You're his child, and he cares. John 14, 1 through 6, these are words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in, in our consideration of the Lord's Prayer, we have examined the various phrases that make up the Lord's Prayer. And in it, we see a relationship, our Father. In it, we see a refuge, our Father, which art in heaven. We see reverence, our Father, which art in heaven hallowed be thy name. And today, as we further consider the Lord's Prayer, we take the next three words, wherein we see readiness, thy kingdom come. And in offering such a prayer as thy kingdom come, we are in a sense declaring our readiness for a coming king and for that resultant kingdom that he shall establish. And so as we venture upon this portion of the Bible's most familiar prayer, Thy kingdom come, we will see an announcement, we'll see an acknowledgement, and we'll also see our anticipation. You recall that on the night before Jesus was crucified, he made an announcement. He made an announcement to his disciples. It was, it was a monumental proclamation recorded for us right here in John chapter 14 verses 2 and 3 where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you and... If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What an announcement! I'm going to go away, but I'm coming again. What a promise made by Jesus to his disciples. I will come again. That promise, that announcement, was first made by Jesus only hours before he was crucified. Then later, about seven weeks later, two angels confirmed that promise. Two angels confirmed the promise that Jesus made, and they made those two angels confirm that promise to Jesus' disciples only moments after Jesus ascended into heaven to the disciples who were, who were gazing skyward, two angels said, Men of Galilee, 
Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And in his first epistle to Thessalonian Christians, the Apostle Paul informs us that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And then later, the book of Hebrews assures us that Jesus is going to appear a second time. And when he does, he will bring salvation to all of those who are waiting for him. And John's first epistle would finally state that when he shall appear, when Jesus shall appear, we shall see him as he is. Now, before he made that initial announcement of his return, Jesus encouraged his disciples to have faith. He said in John chapter 14 and verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. And I would say, that if we are to be prepared for the coming king, if any of us is going to be able to confident, confidently pray for that kingdom to come, that kind of readiness begins with faith in Jesus Christ. And so, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, if you are trusting in Jesus and him alone for salvation, then you can confidently pray, Thy kingdom come. That's a promise that Jesus made, I will come again. It's a promise that he made 2,000 years ago. And that, that promise was made almost 2,000 years ago does give rise to scoffers who object, where? Where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Where is the promise of his coming? It's been 2,000 years. And you know what? I find that to be a reasonable and natural contention. After all, 2,000 years is a long time. But I also find it to be a flawed argument. It is flawed because it imposes the natural laws of time and space upon an eternal and infinite God. It is flawed because it confines God to the limitations of human perception. So sure, to you and me, 2,000 years is a really long time. But to God, if I may say so, that ain't nothing. To God, it is nothing. To God, a thousand years is like a day. And a day is like a thousand years. To, to the eternal and infinite God, time is irrelevant. Our God is not confined to the limitations of human perception. To me, the passing of time, even 2,000 years, does not diminish the certainty that Jesus is coming again. And that is because the promise of Christ's return is not based upon the finitude of time on earth. The certainty of Christ's return rests upon the faithfulness of God. 
If Jesus says, I will come again, then Jesus is going to come again. Within 24 hours of Jesus' announcement that he would come again, at which time he would establish his kingdom, somebody became the very first person to make an acknowledgement of that kingdom. And that someone was not even privy to Jesus' words, I will come again. That someone wasn't even there when Jesus said, I will come again. That someone was not a follower of Jesus Christ. That someone was a criminal. That someone was a criminal upon whom the sentence of death was being executed. That someone was a thief on a cross beside Jesus. The following account is recorded for us in the gospel according to Luke. I'll read it for you. One of the criminals who was hanged railed on Jesus saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are in the same con condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And then that criminal said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now those are words of faith. <clears throat> words of faith uttered by a man about to receive the wages of his sins. He acknowledged himself a sinner Worthy of damnation. He said, we receive the due reward of our deeds. He further acknowledged that Jesus was without sin. He said, this man, referring to Jesus, this man has done nothing amiss. And he acknowledged the sovereignty of Jesus. He called him Lord. And this criminal requested of a man who himself was soon to be dead, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, even a great king when dying is not coming into his kingdom but leaving it. Beyond that, a dead man has no kingdom. But this criminal believed that a kingdom beyond earth a kingdom greater than any kingdom of man, he believed that that kingdom was coming and he believed that Jesus was the king of that kingdom. And he, this criminal, though dying, had hope that Jesus would be his savior. And so in faith he prayed to Jesus himself, Lord, remember me. When the day of reckoning comes, Lord, remember me as your own. And you remember what Jesus said to him. Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Here are words of salvation spoken by a dying Savior to a dying sinner. And in the last moments of life, one of those two criminals was saved from their sin 
and became a follower of Christ. But the other criminal, presumably, remained in his sin and likely died in his sin as a foe of Christ. Perhaps before we offer the prayer, Thy kingdom come, we should consider this. When his kingdom comes, will we be found among his followers? Or among his foes. No foe of Christ. Should ever pray. Thy kingdom come. We consider lastly. Our anticipation. While we wait for the king to come, while we wait for this kingdom, what are we supposed to do? What should we do while we wait for that kingdom to come? I suppose, I suppose there are plenty of answers to that question. We should live for Jesus, serve Jesus, serve one another, obey Jesus, love one another, be patient, be kind. But among all those answers, may I impress this final thought upon our hearts. While we wait for that kingdom to come, let us live by faith. If we have faith, then let us live by faith. The Bible seems to indicate that as the coming of the king and his kingdom approaches, events on this earth will become increasingly troublesome. And that makes the words of Jesus in John chapter 14 and verse 1 very impactful. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. When our hearts are troubled, when our world is troubled, faith has a settling effect upon us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. Live by faith. Christians of the first century were enduring persecution for Christ's sake. And maybe they had lost sight of their heavenly, of their heavenly reward. Perhaps, perhaps they had begun to wonder whether Christ was coming back or not. They were tired, they were sorrowful, they were worried, they were doubting. Their bodies were, were weakened, their confidence was shaken, their faith was shrinking. The writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews offered them the following encouragement recorded in Hebrews chapter 10. He said, cast not away your confidence, there is a great reward to come. He said, yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. He said, just live by faith, for the just shall live by faith. So what are we to do while we wait for that kingdom to come? What are we to do after we pray, thy kingdom come? Here's what we do. We live by faith. 
The very last words of Christ recorded in the Bible are these. Jesus says, I come quickly. May our response be, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.